Okay, um, welcome to the inaugural Anthropology of Time lecture, uh, an ASA network set up by Dr. Gabriella Manley, our former student who's now at Durham. Um, sorry for the delay, it's a tech issue, we didn't get the room until two, um, and I appreciate that people were waiting around here and online as well. Um, so the order of events, I'm not going to say very much, the order of events is that Simone Abraham, the chair of the ASA, will give a short introduction, um, as the network is part of the Association of Social Anthropologists of the UK and Commonwealth. Gabriella will then introduce our speaker and she will be chairing the meeting. Sean will be chairing the Zoom questions and interaction. And then it will be over to Chloe Arman, um, our guest from Cornell, to speak for about 45, 50 minutes uh, on the lecture. We'll then take some um, questions. We'll take it from the floor and from our Zoom audience. And all in all, hopefully, uh, which should be an enjoyable and engaging occasion. So at this point, I'd like to hand over to Simone Abraham of uh, Durham University. She's the chair of the Association for Social Anthropologists, uh, just to give a few words for five or 10 minutes um, as an introduction. Thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks very much. Um, I'm so pleased to be able to join you today. I'm sorry that I couldn't join you in person. Um, yeah, that's the that's the trouble being based right down south in the north of England. Um, but I'm I'm really particularly pleased to see uh, a new network on the um, the anthropology of time. Not least because my own research interests are very much in that area. So it's a particular pleasure for me to welcome you to the ASA. I want to say a few a few words about the ASA because I realise that not everybody understands what it is or even knows about us. And the Association for Social Anthropology is a professional association and it was founded in 1946 to promote the study and teaching of anthropology and to uphold the interests and the status of the discipline. Uh, I know that something that people often ask is what's the difference between the ASA and the RAI, the Royal Anthropological Institute, and there are two differences that you should be aware of. One is that the RAI is um, a sort of a full field all anthropology um, uh, organization and it's a it's an interest group, so anybody can join the RAI if they can afford the membership, they can join. The ASA is a professional association, it's specifically for people who have a qualification in social anthropology. Um, and um, we are there to defend your interests if you're a member of the organisation. So we do a number of things, we hold an annual conference, usually in the spring, um, hosted in the UK, sometimes in, in other countries. Um, and in that conference, we'll also have a, um, a lecture, a public lecture in honor of uh, Firth, who first uh, uh, was one of the founding members of the ASA. And then we will always publish a monograph from the conference. Um, now, uh, one of the things that I've done as the chair of the ASA in the last few years, um, partly but not only because I arrived along with COVID, nothing to do with me, uh, but the first thing we had to do uh, the ASA was postponed the and postponed the conference and and put it online and it was a good opportunity to rethink why we have conferences. Obviously, we need to meet and talk to each other, share our ideas, share our learning, move the discipline on. But occasionally, we forget that we should also be talking to the outside world as well. So we've decided to change the format of the, of the conferences. Every other year, we will have a big international conference, uh, and every other year in between. We might have a smaller conference or we might do as we do next year we're going to hold a festival of anthropology in april early april in manchester because it coincides with the 75th anniversary of the manchester department and that's going to be very much a festival that everything that anthropology does and anthropologists do uh, with all sorts of exciting activities so please do uh, keep an eye on our website for further information or if you're a member you'll receive the newsletter to tell you all about that um other things that the ASA does is that we host uh, and regularly update the ethical guidelines for anthropological research. And we also have a navigational tool to help you manage the bureaucracy of ethical applications. That's also on the website. We have a directory of members that can be used uh, by anybody to see who works on what. And we've just, uh, we are just launching a register of PhD abstract so that when you get your PhD you can register the abstract online and it means that not only everybody else knows what you're doing but we all know what the current state of research is in social anthropology um, and we also publish annual update on what's happening in anthropology departments 
I won't go on and it will take too long, but I will point you to the ASA website and I'm just gonna write the um, write the address in the chat to make sure that everybody has it. It's the most fabulously memorable URL, which is unusual, it's just theasa.org. And there you can find information about the networks, uh, the events, the publications, uh, all of the activities that the ASA does, and also much more information about how to join. And that's, you can find that under the sa.org slash membership. Uh, it is probably the um, least expensive association of any learned association in the UK, uh, which is as good as an encouragement as I can offer uh, to get you to join. But really the most important thing is that um, the ASA is, an off is a form of solidarity where we can work together, we can support each other, we can promote our discipline together, whether you're in a university, whether you're in a business, whether you're in a community organization, whether you just want to be working with other anthropologists, please do join us. So on that note, I'm absolutely thrilled to say uh, congratulations on the new uh, Anthropology of Time. I hope it's going to be a really fantastic uh, event, not just today, but the rest of the, the rest of the event. And I wish you uh, all the best and offer you all the support that ASA can offer. Thank you very much. Thank you, Simone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great to have you here, even virtually. Um, oh, I just oh, I changed the slides. Oh, we can do it. I'm sorry. Gabriella. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> no, how do I show Zoom? That's what this is happening. Well, I didn't touch it. Oh my gosh. We can still see in, in the TV online. Yeah, we just want to be able to show Zoom on that. Yeah, sorry. Definitely in the way. No, so not the slide, though. Yeah. Uh, I have to sign back in. <laughs> we have to zoom out and log out of the Zoom? Sorry? To log out of Zoom? We have to log back in. Okay. Go ahead. You can still be heard. Can, can yeah. everyone hear me? Yes, should I go? <laughs> okay. <laughs> right. I'm sorry, everybody, for the. Um, this is this is anthropology. Also, I was encouraged to make some jokes about how this is the anthropology of time network and we're not on time. I will not be doing that. Um, <laughs> but thank you so much, Simone, for introducing the ASA and making the, the network possible. Welcome everyone to the inaugural lecture of the Anthropology of Time Network. It's a very young network. It was founded in 2021 after what we in the department would consider, well, me, Daniel, and Felix down in Durham considered a sort of very stark rise of interest in time. Um, we were all studying time and we noticed that there was a lot of new scholarship on time that lacked a common space to meet and exchange ideas. Time is uh, nebulous, it's all encompassing and it does transcend a lot of the disciplinary and ethnographic boundaries that we have in anthropology. Yet we found that all these contemporary studies of time often struggle to break out of these particular ethnographic or regional interest groups that we have. And a temporal analysis was often approached as a sort of subcategory or sub analysis within the broader ethnographic boundaries that we have in our discipline. So, with uh, the Anthropology of Time Network, we hope to centralize time and temporality as key theoretical analytics and an ethnographic approach in anthropology. We hope to become a point of contact for anthropologists across sub disciplines and uh, varied ethnographic sites that are interested in time and temporality, a place for us to come together. Time continues to grow as an analytic in anthropology, from historical anthropology to political anthropology, medical anthropology, and everything in between. And the influence that multiple fractured, accelerated, decelerated temporalities have on our field sites is becoming ever more prominent. And this is particularly in the face of an accelerated climate change, where everyday life begins to be governed by accelerated timelines of apocalypse, of ends, of beginnings, and lost histories and futures. So in a world in which we are increasingly racing against time to avoid the mass extinction and tensions grow between short-term fixes and long-term sustainable solutions, we think the study of time and temporality has become both inescapable and crucial. And it's because of this that we're delighted to have here today, Chloe Armand, Dr. Chloe Armand, to give the inaugural lecture for the network, Time Bomb, Toxic Disavowal in the Shadow of Apocalypse. 
So Dr. Aman is an environmental anthropologist studying the long afterlife of the American industry and the temporal entanglement that arise from it. Having earned her PhD from George Washington University in 2018, she is now assistant professor at Cornell University. Her current work is based in Baltimore, where she follows industrialism's enduring traces in toxified landscapes, patchy regulation, everyday expressions of white supremacy, and particular orientations towards time. And is particularly interested in what kinds of environmental futures take from amid these legacies. Her upcoming book, Futures After Progress, Hope and Doubt in Late Industrial Baltimore, is to be published by Chicago University Press in May 2024. It explores the central role of speculation in American life from the vantage point of late industrial South Baltimore and speaks to many of the network's aims. It tells the story of a place forego to enable futures elsewhere, from its early life as a quarantine zone under precautionary public health regimes, through years spent provisioning the military for both real and speculative warfare and culminating in plans to build the nation's largest trash incinerator, build as a client solution and euphemistically called Fairfield Renewable Energy Project. Dr. Arman's work perfectly encapsulates the theoretical and ethnographic depth offered by temporal approaches, and her work has played and continues to play a key role in recentralizing temporal analytics as crucial elements in the study, fight, and theorization of climate and ecological futures. So without further ado, there have been a lot of it. <laughs> Dr. Clary Arman. Are we good? Yeah, I'm just going to close my eyes. Go ahead. Okay. I'm going to try really hard not to touch anything. Um, but <laughs> um, it's such a pleasure to be here and have the chance to speak about my work. I want to give big thanks to uh, Simone for introducing uh, the ASA and the Anthropology of Time Network, to Gabrielle and Daniel for the warm introduction um, and, and the generous invitation. It's my first trip to Scotland. Um, it is a particular privilege to be delivering the inaugural lecture for the Anthropology of Time Network, which for uh, just a couple years now, right, 2021, has done a remarkable job building community and uh, infrastructure around uh, scholars who are committed to asking new and better questions about one of our field's oldest curiosities. So as Gabriella said, I'm a historical and environmental anthropologist, according to the blurb on my faculty page and to the divisions that traditionally we use to parse ethnographic expertise at least in the North American Academy. But as a colleague once accused me with a mix of affection and disdain, what I really am is a time scholar. Uh, so this accusation came at my book workshop a while back, which was stressful enough without the existential crisis. And I left trying to dissect the disdain that label carried in that moment, which was really a question about why I had taken a subordinate theme like time which is to say a theme that nests underneath the structuring categories of our discipline, like urban anthropology or economic anthropology or the anthropology of Europe and on and on, and given it top billing. Across the pond, the American Anthropological Association, oh no, <laughs> not, my, not my problem, lays claim, it lays claim to 38 specialized sections and 20 different journals not one under the banner of time and temporality. And so beneath that mix of affection and disdain, I think there was a genuine concern about how the book might court an audience. This invitation is a lovely retort, so thank you again for having me to speak about the work. But in all seriousness, the reason that I am so fundamentally interested in time is because my interlocutors are. So on the slim South Baltimore Peninsula, where I've been working since 2010, people know that time is political that honing a sharp analysis of time can mean wielding political power, and that there's nothing subordinate about political power. They also know that honing an analysis of time, responsive to the mood of moment in time, can mean wielding more, as I'll get into in this talk. First, though, we're a little farther from South Baltimore than I usually am when I talk about my work, so I want to take a beat and go there. Oh my, hopefully. Yes, great. Um, so Baltimore is a mid-sized city in the state of Maryland, which is on the mid-Atlantic coast of the United States, founded as a port town back when we were part of the same empire. And the neighborhood where I work is over here. It's a heavily industrialized peninsula on Baltimore's far southern edge, where factory jobs these days are all too rare, but factory de debris remain inescapable. And where before I was a time scholar, I worked as a primary school teacher. If you glimpse the top right corner of the map, you can see why some call this place the snaggletooth of Baltimore. 
So returning now to time and more precisely to futurity, my work tells a story from this place, but not only about it. It's about the absolutely integral role that this site has played in the governance of future danger for the past 200 years from, uh, now I'm repeating Gabriella, right? <laughs> from its early life as a quarantine zone under America's precautionary public health regimes, through years spent provisioning the US military for both real and speculative warfare and manifest in recent plans to build the nation's largest trash incinerator there, which as Gabby said, was built as a climate solution, same air quotes, right, coming from both of us, and euphemistically called the Fairfield Renewable Energy Project. So very, very broadly, I consider how efforts by city, state, nation, and corporation to master the future have produced an ambiguously toxic atmosphere that has shaped years of local people's lives. And I explore or how people living here amid the haze kicked up by an aging industrial order relate to the future after long held expectations fall apart. Much of my work dwells within this murky aftermath considering the modes of speculative imagination taking hold on this peninsula, some of which are honestly quite hopeful. As I propose in my forthcoming book, which got a cover last week, um, South Baltimore is a place where people are reckoning with the end of a life world. And so it has a lot to teach about the paths we might yet take in the face of ecological apocalypse. But today, I don't wanna speak allegorically about what we might learn from this peninsula. I wanna speak in very concrete terms about what this relentless pull toward the future has meant for people living in South Baltimore. I wanna do this here uh, in front of a group that need not be convinced that time has real political entailments. And now in the wake of a major local accident, a devastating blast at this coal terminal, which is a stone's throw from homes, schools, parks, businesses, that broke windows and sent a thick layer of carcinogenic coal dust into the air, which coated every surface in a 12 block radius. So deliberations at the city, state, uh, and corporate level, which are unfolding as we speak, concern what steps should be taken to prevent the next disaster. And this is of course, a really important conversation to be having, but it also risks repeating a containment of danger to the future that has long structured violence in this part of Baltimore. So the talk I'll share takes us to a moment in the late Cold War that has been feeling awfully familiar to me lately. It was a moment when industrial accidents were on the rise in this part of uh, Baltimore and residents of two local neighborhoods, Fairfield and Wagner's Point, fought for a buyout of their homes through recourse to the threat of next disaster. Their campaign was not a silver bullet, as you can plainly see, but it was a brilliant response to the Cold War state's fixation on apocalypse. So today I want to propose that this campaign hinged on a deft analysis of time, calibrated to the dominant concerns of a moment in time, and that it shows us why a study of time matters. It also shows us that deft analyses can sometimes carry devastating costs. So a quick note on the title, Time Bomb. I mentioned earlier that I'm interested in time because my interlocutors are, and so it won't surprise you that I borrow this phrase from a former resident. You'll see that it is an incredibly perceptive term for parsing complex temporalities of injury, but it's also a useful term politically as it invites a real sustained analysis of cause. A time bomb is something with explosive potential that starts ticking well before the boom. It names a problem that grows explosive over time. So the argument behind the argument that I'll offer you today is that the recent coal blast started at least 200 years ago, and that time scholars in my field are working hard to make this clear to those in power, lest we repeat the tragedy that follows. You can't say toxics, but you can be very agitated about blowing up, Rena told me in April 2016. Rena was an older white woman who provided legal support to residents of South Baltimore who sought to leave their homes in the 1990s. And we were sitting in her living room discussing what she remembered of the buyout. I'd asked her to describe the place to me. Rena worked with residents of Wagner's Point and Fairfield, collectively the point, uh, both on the South Baltimore Peninsula located here and here. For more than a century before their homes were purchased and demolished, the segregated towns had housed two tight-knit groups of people. So the all black Fairfield homes are once what somebody, some people call the Cadillac of housing projects. Polish families in Wagner's Point lived in the same red houses for a hundred years. Today, the only remnant of their presence is a mid-century brick building first constructed as a school and since converted into a warehouse that, that uh, 
built for containers that have hazardous materials. So you can get a sense of the sedimented place that I work in. Now, before I spoke with Rena, I had driven through the point plenty of times. I'd been hit by its acerbic smell and grown accustomed to the heavy airborne matter that clings to nearly everything. But my first visit happened about eight years after residents left their homes. What did it look like, I asked, when people actually lived here? Look, said Rena, setting down her mug to pantomime. It looked as though an angry god had taken some monopoly pieces, the houses, and thrown them in, in the middle of this big industrial ring. So for all the subtle signs of trouble in the air that I'd rattled off, she wanted me to know that there were starker dangers here than air pollution. People didn't leave because it smelled bad. People left because they thought the ring around them could blow up at any time. And some of it already had by the time Rena arrived into the scene. Minnie, an elderly white woman and a former resident of Wagner's Point, had a different answer to the question. When I asked her about the local past, she dragged an overstuffed brown suitcase from underneath her bed and pulled out bags of family photos and newspaper pieces. In one, a feature from the paper announced Minnie's wedding to her husband. In another, the handwritten phrase, time bomb waiting to happen, appeared above a list of local factories. This is penned by Minnie's late husband. How unfortunate, read a book kept in another bag, that this town is today the least attractive. In a fourth, a photo showed a sign at the entrance to Wagner's Point with the graffiti greeting, welcome to hell. Question mark, exclamation point, question mark, stuck to a Polaroid of many sons swimming. So by the end of the 20th century, the point had become a place of jarring contradictions. Intersections of Carbon Avenue and Sun Street, Quarantine Road and Efficiency Way, junked cars, sunflowers, row homes, and oil tanks marked a part of the city that looked like a terrible accident, the act of an angry god, in Rena's words. Of course, people living here would want to flee. Insiders, though, saw a death trap that had once felt like a haven. It would take the prospect of grave harm to abandon what had long felt life safe, safe neighborhoods, and it would take a savvy campaign by residents to make that prospect the foundation of their exit strategy. Before that happened, Fairfield and Wagner's Point were tiny bunkers, insulated from the violence that many locals said was rampant over there in Baltimore. Now, the point's part of Baltimore, but it felt apart for many reasons, including the centuries-long effort to, by state agents to contain environmental risk to this periphery that Gabby lost and then I repeated earlier on. Um, that effort had led to a level of industrial concentration that posed real harm to residents, but containment was also one of the point's most attractive features. Many told me about the little walls that people built around their lives. In a world that often seemed beyond control, they took some comfort in the boundaries. So men replaced their work pants every day, women kept their homes immaculate, and area schools remained segregated by race decades after the courts ordered them to integrate with all deliberate speed. Even residents of all Black Fairfield critical of segregation valued other kinds of insulation. So being neglected meant avoiding more acute forms of state violence. Jenny, an older Black woman, said chemicals didn't scare her like police dogs did. And people were close. Downtown, they had crime, one Fairfield woman told me, while well, we had community. So if, as Rena put it, houses sat in a big industrial ring, it was also true that many enjoyed elements of their enclosure until they didn't. In the 1980s, locals began to see that certain forms of containment were hypothetical at best, but that they were truly trapped by industry. Now for many on the point, this insight came in fits and starts, slow forms of toxic trespass, vague illnesses, explosion, fire, catastrophic leak. On one hand, residents were getting sick from local air, which was thick with carcinogens at levels 30 times higher than the government considered safe, precipitating cancer rates significantly higher than the citywide average, which was higher than the state, which at the time was the highest in the nation, which stark as it was, did not have legal teeth. On the other, people were rattled by explosions coming from the region's chemical and petroleum plants. And so containment seemed to fail dramatically. And it was in this context that residents began to agitate for relocation. They did so in a very particular way. Rather than decrying the enduring impacts of exposure to secure state recognition, residents emphasize their potential demise in the event of a catastrophe. So the events leading up to the buyout hold valuable lessons. 
about how thresholds of acceptability get breached, about the chasm between lay and expert forms of sight, about the politics of everyday exposure versus those of more spectacular injury. They also underscore something anthropologists of time and politics know well, which is that disasters make things happen. But what is perhaps most achingly instructive concerns why residents' hypothetical deaths came to carry more weight than their real ones. So the buyout turned around a choice to limit charges to the future possible. And you'll see it happened at a time when government and industry had both retreated to the hypothetical, staving off imagined harms while disavowing dangers that were terribly concrete. So as a strategy of last resort, residents seized on this concern by adopting a politics of threat, incalculable potential harm. Threat deals in cataclysmic hypotheticals does not politicize long-term exposure or systemic poverty. Instead, threat management in the post-Adam bomb United States has been a highly conceptual enterprise in which sensational projections overwhelm the everyday. Threat proceeds as if the most existential obstacles to life lay then in the devastating future and not now, ambient and tedious. It is a strictly anticipatory domain where danger is conjectural and the narrative stress is on what has not happened yet. You'll soon see that even devastating uh, threats that realize themselves as real explosions on the point seem to matter more as omens of a coming harm than they did as lived experience. Now, there were very good reasons to be concerned with cataclysm in this place. My point is not that this was the wrong political object. In fact, it was in the late Cold War probably the only political object that could do the work that people needed. Because here in a place so profoundly shaped by future oriented governance, hypotheticals had force and residents knew this. They'd watched a dark and stormy picture of the future overtake the political sphere. So what are we to make of their choice to adopt a politics of threat and treat the future as if it mattered most? Did it pander to a violent system? In some ways, certainly. There's something deeply compromised about participating in a narrative that contains the local past in bags and stuffs it underneath the bed when you feel that past accounts for present suffering. But residents needed to get out more than they needed an internally consistent politics. And perhaps like many acts of containment, this move produced a kind of prickly comfort. It kept better times out of the mess. It did not desecrate attachments to this place. In telling the story of the buyout, though, I want to be very clear that residents like Minnie and lawyers like Brina did not naively reproduce the conditions of the point subjection. They recognized the difficulty of politicizing historical exposures in an ambiguously toxic place. I see the choice that followed from this recognition as a studied response to the politics of the next disaster to shape life politics during the late Cold War, and maybe still if we keep the recent cold blast in mind. Despite knowing that their vulnerability had been produced over years of exposure and neglect, residents took advantage of the state's fixation with the future to get what they needed to escape their neighborhoods. It's hard to appreciate the weight of residents' choice without first addressing how they landed in a place where it seemed like the best option. And this was why Minnie responded to my questions with her suitcase full of papers. Little clues spilled out of bags and onto the threadbare pages of my notebook while Minnie walked from an armchair in the corner. I remember trying to use the suitcase as a prop, asking questions as I parsed through documents, but it was clear she didn't want to narrate. The whole thing stood in stark contrast with the wry confidence that enabled Rena to compare life on the point with an ill-fated game of Monopoly. The way that Rena put it, residents were thrown into harm way by a temperamental god sometime in the 80s. It was a simpler story than the one that Minnie's suitcase told, which is that people lived on the peninsula before it was industrial and stayed despite the dangers. In fact, one thing that became clear as I spread out with Minnie's suitcase was that the very schemes designed to ensure urban, national, and corporate futures had gradually worn away at people's prospects here. It also became clear that residents were invested in the Disappearing Act and in this tiny sliver of South Baltimore, even though the place was killing them. And not because they were beguiled, because their personal and familial futures had intertwined with corporate ones over generations, tethered first by jobs and then by homes because those homes were their only assets after work here disappeared. 
Mindy didn't share her suitcase with me right away. Between 2015 and 2016, we crossed paths each week at Seniors Club, a casual gathering hosted at the recreation center by the Cole Piers. Elders came to settle scores through cutthroat bingo games. Minnie didn't play. She sat along the wall selling sodas for a quarter. I sometimes bought a can to say hello, but Minnie only answered with a nod, eyes down, back straight. She was a shy, elegant woman who stood out in an otherwise playful group. She sipped her soda with a straw and ate her sandwich with a fork. Sometimes she'd listen as other seniors reminisced about how nice this place once was, but she rarely did join him. I didn't really know anything, she'd say, and then she'd walk away. So I was surprised one afternoon when Minnie tapped me on my shoulder and handed me her husband's obituary tied up with a string. I know it's tacky, but you should know the truth, she declared. Not knowing what to do, I thanked her. The write-up said he died after a years-long battle with cancer. It would be another three months before Minnie approached me again and said she wanted me to look at some papers. It turned out the obituary was just the first in a series of exhibits that she had set aside two decades back to help secure a buyout for her neighbors. So something that came through strongly in my time with Minnie and other elders was that things were different on the point before, before life became untenable, before conditions neared catastrophe. Seniors pined for the days they used to hunt and swim off the coast. Minnie arrived during World War II, but she'd heard of a time when the coast was lined with dozens of fruit trees. While no one that I met uh, lived when the point was mostly farmland, the inherited impression was that things moved slowly, folks were left to their own devices, and life had not much been disturbed by industrial pursuits. All that changed by the 1870s. Seeking to capitalize on the second industrial revolution, a few powerful families incorporated and began selling off land. They advertised the point as the most desirable spot for working men and an ideal site for heavy industry. Print ads boasting that money invested in this land will always be safe, even double itself in very short order, were among the first attempts to link individual financial futures to the promise of prodigious corporate growth. And for those in need of additional incentive, one company offered purchasers a free plot in the local burial grounds, which came to be known as Bonus Land Cemetery. These ads attracted a range of businesses and a diverse array of people. Chief among them were poor immigrant workers from Central Europe escaping famine and unrest. Black families also moved to Baltimore from further south as Jim Crow laws became increasingly repressive. And these were laws that enforced racial segregation decades after abolition. Intergroup dynamics were not egalitarian, but the peninsula was considerably more integrated than Baltimore City. And homes available on the point were decent compared with those that Black and immigrant families could afford downtown. They also came with land amenable to rural life ways, which many practiced into the 20th century. So Mini Suitcase offered insight into a time when this was a peaceful, verdant place. And this was something Rena's perspective made very difficult to see. It wasn't at all that an angry God had thrown houses into a ring of fire. If anything, that God had permitted volatile developments to encroach upon a calm pastoral people. But Reno was right that by a certain point, residents here were engulfed. Oil companies were among the largest landholders by the 1910s, excuse me, leading some to call this area the carbon belt of Baltimore. Chemical and shipbuilding businesses were also growing steadily, and there were signs of trouble in the air. So in 1920, one of the region's asphalt tanks caught fire when lightning from a summer storm ignited a pocket of gas beneath its lid. The fire raged for 26 hours, leaving the adjacent river flaming. Before the fire, the point was not a part of Baltimore. It was a rural site beyond its southern border and the reach of its health laws and things too risky to be built downtown, like asphalt tanks were sited here. Here, Baltimore quarantined contagious bodies that threatened the good health of its population and built landfills for the city's waste, while locals fueled production in a kind of legal no man's land. Production boomed, and by, the, uh, by 1918, excuse me, it had boomed so much that Baltimore decided it was in the city's fiscal interest to absorb this region. So propping up a now internal boundary would be zoning, which is an urban planning tool that pursues healthy futures through the management of space, and specifically by means of segregation, dividing industry from commerce from residents. And here, of course, I'm thinking with the insight that urban planning is a way of thinking through the possibilities that time offers space. To this, we might add race because 
As Baltimore-based scholars show, the city's earliest experiment with zoning occurred in 1910 with the nation's first comprehensive racial zoning law, which sought to neutralize the health threats that Black neighbors allegedly posed to white communities. So when racial zoning laws were struck down by the courts, which they were rather quickly, use-based zoning took its place, also justified in terms of public health. Officials explained that coding distinct tracts of land for different desired uses would prevent accidents and provide Baltimoreans with fresh, clean air to breathe. The city's first comprehensive land use ordinance passed in 1931 sought to minimize potential future problems by situating danger on the city's margins, reserving the point for heavy industry. Now, this is a rather dry bureaucratic moment, but it marked a critical moment for residents. For one, like classic instances of seeing like a state, zoning suffered from a partial vision common among modernist planning schemes. By representing land as absolute space or space from which all lived complexities might be banished, this rubric made the point legible to planners as non-residential. So all of a sudden it was as if there were no people near the factories. The zoning law of course did not unpeople the peninsula. Families lived in the same houses they'd occupied before the ordinance and thousands more arrived during World War II when the federal government built housing here under a wartime state of exception. For decades, the law decreed a willful ignorance about the working class and racialized people brought to live in the so-called industrial region. Zoning in, in short concealed human presence on this point, stipulating that it was not fit for life. And with time that hypothetical would produce real problems for real people. Zoning is an important part of the peninsula's history. One of the deliberate choices that would eventually make life there so untenable. Why? By disavowing residential life, it actually intensified the risks of industry. The policy ended up deterring city officials from making basic infrastructural improvements on the point, leaving these communities to deteriorate. Known as the early, in the early 1900s as a self-sufficient enclave, white ethnic Wagner's Point had no store, no public phone, and no post box by the 1970s. Conditions were rougher still in Fairfield, which lost its status as a rare integrated community after wartime barracks transitioned into all black public housing. As late as 1976, many Fairfield homes lacked sewage lines. One, for, uh, one visiting reporter said it felt anachronistic and another published this decrepit scene. Nowhere else in my wanderings have I known city government to be quite so tolerant of assorted junk, shoulder high weeds and defunct buildings that should be demolished. Quite plainly, the city regards Fairfield as industrial the way it is zoned and not residential the way it humanly happens to be. By many counts, in fact, zoning disallowed life here. So even though Fairfield and Wagner's Point had the lowest median incomes in the city, their zoning designation made them ineligible for certain poverty alleviation programs. It prohibited residents from operating a community grocery. The same formal disregard that led the city to insist the point was free of people also meant that regulation here was lax. One oil worker at BP, then British Petroleum, told me harrowing stories about what his bosses did to improve efficiency. Sometimes they'd have us work 40 hours straight and we'd fall asleep at the gauge. Tanks would explode and that was a terrible thing. Everyone would run and you could see skin peeling off each other's bodies because the heat was so intense. The fires also peeled paint from company vehicles. These charges swear with others that I've heard and this was not a lone emergency. So the same year the sky above BP turned red, a railroad car carrying 9,000 gallons of sulfuric acid overturned, forcing 700 residents to evacuate at dawn. Officials blame the spill on a soft spot in the road. And what this means is that minor oversights, degraded infrastructure, unpaved streets, were becoming major liabilities. Still, many residents found security in the peninsula's social infrastructure, this is a term I borrowed from Rena, who we met at the beginning. And it's something scholars have observed in other contexts of exposure. One Wagner's Point woman put it this way, I know the environment may not be safe, but the community is. People in the tight enough towns looked out for one another. Everyone knew where the old, poor, and sick resided. And even industry was in the paternalistic habit of paying for holiday gifts and heating bills. I don't see anywhere else in the state of Maryland, the woman said, where people would get the kind of security they have here. 
that security took different forms in different neighborhoods. So residents of all Black Fairfield built a network of connections that made life possible despite discrimination. Polish families in Wagner's Point took comfort in the private enclave they'd fostered over years. Some also felt that government neglect had benefits. Again, white children from Wagner's Point rode buses past Fairfield's all-Black school for decades after schools downtown were forced to integrate. So being hidden meant freedom from state interference. There were other ways that local people maintained lives marked by containment, exerting a measure of control while industrial matters seep beyond its boundaries. Containment was a practice of endurance, an act of zoning out uh, composed of daily disavowals. So men took their dirty work clothes off before they came inside and women swept obsessively. Without the structural safeguard zoning offered other Baltimoreans, locals took it upon themselves to protect their homes from industrial incursion. Some wiped down surfaces to guard against exposures. Others plastic wrapped their things to keep away airborne pollution, even as it slipped inside by other means. Jenny tended to raise garden beds while the whole world changed around her. Minnie kept the flag above her front door press. Many kept their windows tightly shut. Little comforts, habits, cautions, boundaries. And then in 1984, something blew up, an Essex industrial chemical. It shook buildings, broke windows, and sent 14 people to the hospital. Neighbors claimed the event put up a mushroom cloud, like the bomb at Hiroshima. And then a few months later, another spill released a heady acid, acid cloud. Many remember the cloud as proof of her endangerment. I knew the air was bad, she'd said, but that was the first time I'd actually seen it. You might recall that Rena was a bit more crass. You can't see toxics, but you can be very agitated about blowing up, she'd said to me. She wasn't wrong. Compared with earlier events, accidents beginning in the 1980s seemed to have an outsized force. They were steeped in the uncertain industrial economy as job loss eroded locals' patients with pollution. They were weighted by the existential insecurities of the environmental era as chemical violence became a part of public discourse. And unlike quotidian experiences of exposure, they were visceral, quick, and clear. Minnie's memory therefore marked a felt distinction that would later be translated into strategy. A recognition that certain forms of harm offered clearer proof than others that life was unsafe here. If popular imaginings of the point at the start of the 20th century were romantic and pastoral, its aura near the end was practically apocalyptic. Accidents were getting worse with more than 50 plants producing high risk products at unprecedented speed. The end seen nine other ways as well. So job loss shattered financial futures for the working class and synthetic chemicals posed threats to reproductive ones. All this in a world historic moment marked by grave disasters. Love Canal, Three Mile Island, Bhopal, Chernobyl. No longer local people were worried. Folks took bets on how long their communities would last. People joked that the end times were near. I'm told that children sang dark nursery rhymes and some teased that if a single plant were to explode, it would be like boom, 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 the domino effect. And the plant would get blown off the map of the city. Besides convincing locals that the time had come to fight for relocation, Accidents had what some call an enabling power. They lent the point a hyper-visibility. So all of a sudden, come the late Cold War, the state was prepared to acknowledge that people lived in the shadow of heavy industry. But when residents suddenly appeared to state officials, they appeared within a very narrow frame. They appeared as the potential victims of a chemical catastrophe. While it was also true that they suffered cancer rates among the highest in the nation, the state did not step in to protect health. They vowed to prepare for explosive future threats under the Cold War program of preparedness. And the idea to rip off scholars of this project was to prepare for the worst so as to prevent it or to enact dystopic futures as a planning strategy. Among other things, this moment specifically saw the development of Baltimore's chemical hazard plan, which was a direct response to the disaster at Bhopal. And officials were supposed to test it by staging accidents, which many described as dress rehearsals. So maybe twice a year, residents, police, firefighters, the hazmat squad, and big shots from downtown were all invited to watch workers on the point play out scenarios, any one of which would devastate the two communities. During the 80s, local plants poured money into disaster management. 
They instituted new programs, clarified protective measures, simulated accidents, and took other steps to prove that safety mattered. And this went some way toward calming anxious people. But hazard planning did so by eclipsing several key elements of their endangerment. For one, hazard plans located danger squarely in the future, letting the spectacle of prospective accidents to drown out the daily violence of living with toxicity. I want to be clear that this was more than a perceptual displacement. It also had material effects as resources for hazard planning had to come from somewhere. Some came at the expense of precautionary programs, programs that if funded and enforced would not only improve local health, but also mitigate against catastrophe. Remember that a dozen little acts had led to residents engulfment, that poor road and rail car maintenance had spurred the 1979 sulfuric acid spill, that insufficient oversight had fired up the sky above BP. And it wasn't only the case that slow harms could bring about explosive problems. Depending on the chemicals involved, single explosions could impact bodies over generations. Or consider this. In 1984, a chemical leak from another local plant failed to trigger an alert system that would notify officials at a nearby bridge. The cloud pulled a driver's attention from the road, causing an eight-car pileup and 13 injuries. The thing about living in a time bomb is that danger dwells in the beat before the blast, that the quiet and the spectacle are two parts of one machine. Hazard planning missed this defining quality of life on the peninsula. And moreover, because these plans fixated on the hypothetical, they overlooked the place-based details of life on the point, which would have grave consequences in a real emergency. Locals often made this point through recourse to a public service announcement on how residents were supposed to act in a disaster. And Brenda, another lawyer who would later work with Rena on the buyout, laughed as she recounted it. It was ludicrous, she said to me. The short film opened on a man and woman gardening outside their pristine country home. Suddenly they hear sirens ringing in the distance. I'm getting some like knowing smiles from the room, right? We must shelter in place, the man declares robotically. So the couple goes inside, climbs the stairs to their room, and retrieves an emergency kit from underneath their bed. They joyfully enclose their home in several dozen pre-cut plastic sheets. Meanwhile, the scene cuts to the school where masses of children respond to bells with the same efficient calm comportment, all quiet, quick, and perfectly obedient, which is ludicrous, right? Totally not. But no one on the point had an emergency kit. And even if they had, Brenda doubted folks could tape up doors and windows, as most residents were elderly. In any case, it hardly mattered because the row homes in Wagner's Point all shared a common attic crawl space. And what this meant was that if anyone failed to shelter in place, perhaps by not being home, everybody would die no matter how exacting they were being. So this film was plagued by knowledge gaps. It proffered a vision of containment so idealized that it had practically no utility but it did reveal a sphere in which the government was prepared to sustain life in a place it once insisted was unsuitable for people. Unfortunately, real accidents were more complex. In 96, a tank blew up at a chemical plant owned by FMC. Employees had been extremely overworked with many laboring 75 hour weeks with no time off. The explosion that resulted sparked a two alarm fire and injured six people. No alarm sounded. And that day, I kid you not, officials had been away attending an emergency planning meeting, right? And it would be funny if it weren't so horrible. In their absence, according to the hazard plans, tasks necessary for ensuring public safety, alerting residents, controlling access to the site and more would never happen. Residents demanded that officials come to the point and clarify disaster plans. And officials agreed. I think somebody's mic is on, maybe Sean. So two months later, they filled a room, made a brief presentation, and proceeded to show the shelter-in-place PSA on a makeshift screen. Presented in that context, the film radicalized residents. It had alarming implications for those meant to be sheltering in homes separated from explosive plants by just a flimsy chain-link fence. Residents pressed on the spot for an evacuation plan before realizing such a plan would be impractical. The point's single access road was often closed in the event of trouble since responders were supposed to isolate the scene. So what had once seemed a comfort in an otherwise chaotic world, containment, was now a major problem 
made worse by the fact that industry and government have produced a scheme so removed from conditions on the ground that we were pretty much left for dead, as one man put it. The consensus among those present was that something major shifted that evening. So in previous years, residents eager to escape the point had worked with Brenda and Rena to publicize the health effects of living in a toxic atmosphere. It hadn't worked, but hazard planning failures pointed toward an opening. Rather than staking claims for state recognition on their sick bodies, as has so often been the case in context of disaster, to call on vital accounts of Chernobyl and Bhopal, rather than this, they would assert their vulnerability in the future tense. They would perish in the next emergency. Rena explained, it would have been impossible to prove that locals had gradually contracted cancer from one of the region's many plants, but the idea that hazard plans were bad was simpler. You could just look at it and see. So here, as it had with many's exposure to the mushroom cloud, politicizing harm would hinge on visibility. While a core group of residents rallied neighbors after the FMC explosion, the lawyers got to work. Soon they issued a report charging seven companies with violating hazard planning policy. Moreover, the report alleged that when companies did submit their plans, officials let them lie in unopened envelopes. When lawyers opened up the envelopes, it turned out that companies had tasked the Coast Guard with retreating re residents from the shoreline, this shoreline, a shoreline likely to be aflame in the event of an emergency. If residents were lucky enough to reach the shore, the Coast Guard might just meet them there, but they were not equipped with safety equipment like masks that would protect victims on the chemical release. On top of this, the lawyers identified dangerous labor practices and indefensible infrastructural gaps. So some of the chemical plants had backup generators for their lights, for example, but not to maintain the temperature of incredibly volatile tanks should a storm or fire cut off electricity. Both industry and government accused the women of hazmat hysteria, but truly they were scrambling to explain their regulatory lapses. The fire department, for example, argued that the point's industrial density made it impractical to develop detailed plans. Even this is what made, this is what made the plan so critical. Residents broadcast these failures as accidents waiting to happen. And each one that did happen became further fodder for the argument that the next disaster would be cataclysmic. But the complicated truth was that explosions from the region's many plants were more than omens of a coming harm. Each one put off bad airs of its own, slow exposures that provoked slow casualties. Casualties like Minnie's husband, who passed away in 96 after being struck by four different cancers. One was an oral cancer. Minnie called it a smoker's disease. The doctor wouldn't believe he'd never smoked a cigarette in his whole life, Minnie recounted, until he found out the couple lived on the point where chemical releases were incessant. Then in February of 1998, one of the most vocal local activists, Minnie's friend Jeanette, was diagnosed with terminal cancer. She passed away by April, so two months later. Brenda recalled people thinking, if it can happen to her, it can happen to me. And indeed, Jeanette was only one of three people stricken by cancer that year on her rather sparsely populated block. Another told his wife to put this in my obituary, I should be the last person to die here. So residents understood that a focus on preparedness would not capture these losses. And many found this incredibly painful. It stung to bracket the deaths of their loved ones to dramatize the hypothetical. And for a while, the campaign stalled as residents expressed wanting to nail the companies. But officials did not embrace their arguments. Neither did industry executives who denied any responsibility for health problems anecdotal evidence suggested were unusually severe. As one boss explained to a reporter, I'm unaware of any scientific evidence that means we should relocate them. Adding that a buyout won't reduce risk, only allay fears. It was this very ambiguity that convinced Rena to produce, pursue an accident-oriented strategy to begin with. It would not be subject to the minutia of formal risk assessment, which companies had become adept at manipulating. The way she put it, focusing on preparedness allowed us to deal in very concrete terms with how there's only one access road, how the last time there was an explosion, it caused a nine alarm fire and families got split up. Some people were stuck on the wrong side. So these problems were very explainable. I get it, she continued. People were convinced they were sick because of the plants and I don't disagree. 
But the way to go with this was not cancer. There were so few residents you couldn't prove statistical significance. Renus still speaking. And I felt vindicated, she said, when the head of the Chemical Trade Association said on public television, what we need is a health study. She embraced it because she knew you could fiddle around with that kind of a thing, change the assumptions and make a big stink. Well, is it one in a million or one in 50,000? Let's measure all the reported releases. That path would take forever and get us absolutely nothing. Explosions also clarified the stakes of relocation for residents. Living on the point put them directly in harm's way. So locals refocused after Jeanette's death, agreeing to pursue the strategy most likely to get them out. In Rena's words, we pick back up and push the accident thing, broadcasting imminent danger. Pushing the accident thing did not take much. Explosions kept on happening. In May of 98, a tank exploded again at FMC. There were no sirens, no alerts, and no details shared till the next day. Residents were panicked, but they kept busy documenting this event with the next event in mind passing evidence that plans had failed to Brenda, Rena, and the media. In October, a fireball erupted from Condia Vista Chemical, where equipment was in bad repair. It could be heard from miles away, shattering windows and knocking local people on their feet. Some residents stuck watching the 100-foot flames while awaiting official notice, pulled out camcorders to capture the spectacle. And others made contact with reporters who played harrowing footage on the evening news, narrated by locals on live telephone feed. So if the health risks of long-term exposure made for a tenuous case, then botched responses to explosions unambiguously revealed life on the point to be untenable. They undercut precisely the protective role that officials had tried to inhabit, exposing inexcusable flaws in hazard planning. And crucially, as failures of anticipation, they could be broadcast in terms, and limited in, in terms that limited danger to the possible, that kept debate contained. So one could call them problems without claiming injury. Putting the narrative stress on threat allowed the state to acquiesce to the buyout as an act of care rather than an admission of guilt. With uh, local companies were also content to contribute to the buyout fund so long as they would be cleared of liability. Liability waivers tinged the victory, but most residents acquiesced. They had medical bills. They were living in poverty. They could not endure decades of costly litigation. Once the papers were signed and residents cleared out, demolition happened quickly. After a years long struggle capped a century's worth of neglect, the city poured resources into to destroying evidence of their inhabitants. So it had taken about 60 years to install sewage pipes in residential Fairfield, but it took about two weeks to raise the several hundred homes in the region. <clears throat> Many hands me another article, this one about the demolition of the point. It quoted a spokesman for the city announcing officials were happy the area is clear. We no longer have to be concerned with environmental risk here. <clears throat> On some counts, he was right. Industrial proximity was no longer the city's problem and everyone could breathe easier knowing, knowing no one lived in the shadow of the plants. But his relief also underscored the limits of residents' victory. They won by setting aside ambiguous exposures and proceeding as if threat were a, a, as danger were a threat to be avoided, a potential, rather than a condition of life in this peninsula. So it's a fiction with a useful clarity. It's true that by displacing issues of contamination from the realm of political debate and forwarding a definition of protection as emergency preparedness, the buyout failed to address protected harm. In many ways, it released both state and industry from responsibility for a range of problems that were very much ongoing. But it might also have assuaged residents' own regrets. Imagine having to recast a whole life as a cause of death and consider sticky questions of culpability. In a rare confession, one woman told a reporter, I feel guilty that I kept my husband here. Maybe he wouldn't have gotten cancer. Situating danger in the future might have reassured her too. No comforts, habits, cautions, boundaries. How are we to square these minor acts of disavowal with disavowal as a corporate tactic, a profitable refusal to connect industrial pollution with its atmospheric fallout? Are the containments that adhere in many suitcase the same as those emanating from the city? When many put her proof in bags and stuffed it underneath the bed, was she behaving like a docile corporate subject 
Did she get to live the big exhale of no longer being concerned about industrial emissions? If these equations are seductive, it's because they're too easy. For one, they too easily forget the power structures that put locals in a bind, all the little ticks before the time bomb reached the point of no return. Land speculation that brought industry and zoning that sanctioned it while disappearing residential life. Land use policy designed to insulate the city's white elite. Poor corporate regulation and inadequate enforcement of those paltry rules that did exist. Degraded infrastructure, labor exploitation, reckless productivity, an economic system that left residents completely dependent on dangerous work, and when that work left, on homes in perilous conditions. A legal system in which the unrelenting haze of harmful air was too dubious to count as evidence of injury. A political and perceptual sphere so resolutely focused on the hypothetical that it did not register the everyday. They worked on future harms by walling off the past that took up threats and not extended suffering. In the face of all of this, I want to insist on a difference between the disavowals that disallowed life here and those that made it briefly possible. Those countless micro practices and harm in, entailed in making harm go numb in order to survive. So growing things of beauty in a toxified environment, the way that shifting danger to the future might have kept a widow from unraveling. Yes, residents of the point spoke in terms of threat to secure a buyout. No, they cannot be reduced to pawns in someone else's game. Many was clearly conflicted about bracketing historical exposures and others expressed dismay at disaster narratives inability to capture harms already done. But for all of its faults, threat was an argument that worked. And an argument that worked was needed desperately. The insistence we no longer have to be concerned coming from the halls of power though, this line keeps me up at night for a few reasons. For one, it disavows the fact that every explosion is also an exposure. And then when residents moved, some of them to, to the adjacent neighborhood less than a mile away, they carried years of embodied impacts with them. It betrays a deadly selective attention that continues to this day, manifest in the fact that the city is willing to talk about the next disaster on the heels of the recent coal blasts, but not residents' exposure to coal dust every day for 140 years. More to the point, this fixation on the boom and not the everyday disasters, this callous disregard for people's lives and deaths, this politics of time, it gets us here. By making displacement the solution to environmental problems and settling on a course of action that did nothing, nothing to rein in industries embodied or explosive effects, the city all but lit the match. Time scholars are fighting hard to ensure they don't make the same mistake. From the streets to City Hall, residents, activists, and academic allies are putting forth a different analysis of time tuned to a different moment in time because they know how much time matters at this crossroads. How much? Um, well, as Marx reminds, and I'm going to go ahead and claim him as a time scholar too. <laughs> Why not? As Marx reminds, if history repeats, it will not be tragedy but farce. And if it happens again, I think we call it policy. Thanks. You can hear me through this, yeah? yeah, yeah oh, you wanted to be able to hear. Oh, sure. Here. Okay. Hi, everybody. Good to see you. Nice to meet you. Thank you very much, Chloe, and uh, thank you everybody online and here for your patience with the tech at the beginning, but uh, it was worth it. It was worth the wait, I hope. Um, so, I've had a chance to talk with Chloe yesterday and today and tomorrow, so I'm going to open the floor straight away, considering uh, we're a little behind on this. And we'll take some questions from the floor here in the room, and we've got uh, the Zoom participants as well. So let's take a couple here, and let's go to a couple then on Zoom. So. Um, would anybody like to start us off? I just had a question about why I'm talking is that the really young trigger in this case. <clears throat> is that a white piece of paper that has three dots 
I didn't read it at the time. She pulled up the Bible. Did she write it? Her husband wrote it uh, before he passed away. Um, I don't want to mess up the text, so I won't pull it up. But it was uh, he was like triangulating what was being made at several of the plants in the neighborhood. And his his uh, what he found was that the ingredients of mustard gas were being made. And actually, there's an incident in uh, the 80s when a local chemical company was fined for illegally exporting mustard gas to Iran. Um, and so, I mean, just like you can imagine the la the labors that local people went to try and understand the atmosphere in which they lived on a daily basis. And so, so this is a, an artifact of that from, from one resident. Okay. Uh, um, this is the, the lots and lots of question, I suppose, um, just about, I suppose, the role of the press, um, and the role of the press cut in, in particular in the argument of the building. So what ethnographically, where does the press in bigger in terms of the, the network and the kinds of arguments and politics to hear, and also methodologically, um, how you're using the press to build your arguments, and of course, how you know you've got people with press talking, press on with the head. Um, I mean, I'm coming from a context where when the uh, local newspaper in Aleppo was moved to print in Greater Manchester, um, it became derisively called you know, the old Aleppo, and that was used for. Practice versions, you know, non reliable narrator, you know, it's making bad faith arguments. Um, yeah. And it kind of was presented as sort of a neutral authority here, except for the fact that it was kept on the bed in a particular way. And I wonder if you could sort of speak a bit ethnographically about where the Baltimore Sun and other newspapers fit into this. Yeah, I'd be so happy to. You know, there's actually one report. So uh, the time period that I'm talking about here. Was a, was a really different moment for journalism, right? So it's before like the internet gutted newspapers, especially local newspapers. And it was also a time when instead of having kind of clickbait materials, journalists could, could do sort of like long-term neighborhood studies. And so there was a reporter at the Sun named Joe Matthews, who I interviewed as part of my work and who wrote a lot of the sort of like long-term life, pieces about life here in addition to the explosions. He covered this neighborhood for a long time. Um, and he was a very essential part of the, uh, the network that enabled this campaign to eventually succeed to the extent that this could be considered a success. And I, I think everyone involved could understand the ambivalence of that success. Um, but, but Joe Matthews was essential. And when Brenda and Rena, the lawyers come uh, onto the team and, and, and locals start organizing around, uh, around hazard plans, they have connection with the press, right? With this trusted reporter who's been around for a long time. Um, and of course, it's really hard to, to, to fund long-term neighborhood coverage these days. There are, uh, I showed at the very end, a uh, picture of youth activists who are engaged in the current campaign, um, which, which whose immediate object is to uh, stop the storage and transport of coal in this neighborhood. Um, and they have uh, long-term connections with, with reporters too, but not so much from the Sun, Baltimore Sun, which has been bought out by the Chicago Tribune in one of these sort of like conglomerate whatevers. Um, and so the press, um, the press has changed as, as, the, as the moment has changed. But actually, yeah, local reporters like Joe Matthews were, were around to cover the boom <laughs> and the everyday disasters. Um, it's really, really amazing reporting. Yeah, of course. Take a couple from our online community first and come back into the room. So um, Simone Abraham asks, thank you for a magnificent talk. I'd like to ask the obvious question, which was to ask about the relationship between the temporality of disaster with the temporality of crisis. Uh, are they operating in the same way in your view or are there differences, disaster and crisis? That's a great question. Um, I think that, that in many ways, they are operating the same way, but I'm, I'm going to elaborate on why that, that's more complicated. So if you think about the way that crisis has been theorized by critical scholars of time, uh, crisis uh, is sort of like a moment of intense political attention that also creates a blind spot in critical thinking. This is Janet Reutemann, uh, Joe Mosco's work on the crisis in crisis. And there are lots of arguments by, by critical scholars of crisis that um, Crisis blinds us to really making meaningful structural change because our attention is on these exceptions to the norm. And the political response then becomes, well, how do we get back to the normal, right? 
Um, and so there's something about that that is very consonant with the politics of disaster here. Um, what I want to say is that what residents are doing today, and this marks today's political organizing off from the political organizing that was possible in the late Cold War, residents today are taking advantage, so they're seizing on the, the disaster at the recent Cold Pier to make a political argument that the crisis here does not adhere in an event, but in the everydayness of their own exposure. So there's a sort of, there was a moment when crisis politics and disaster politics were very much consonant with each other. And there's a meaningful attempt today um, to change that, mm -hmm. that makes sense. I hope that's responsive to someone's question. Um, Felix is uh, asked online. I don't know if we can bring Felix in because he says he wants to elaborate a bit. Is that okay, Sean? Felix Ringo? Um, can I do that? No, is, can you hear me? Yes. I can. Oh, great. Hi, Chloe. Thanks. Great talk. It was really, really great. I really enjoyed it. My question was about your own, and it kind of follows up on, from what you just said, basically, but your own temple operations with regards to your methodology and how you constructed a field that, from what I understood, is actually not there anymore, or not, not much is left in sight, if you get my gist. But uh, <clears throat> there was also a certain like, rhythm to, the, to, to how you presented it, too. You kind of sped, sped through time and then slowed down again and zoomed in on several kind of bits and pieces here and there. But it all was still linked up to the present. So I kind of I wanted you to reflect upon how you keep all of this together and also what we can learn about time and the anthropology of time given yeah, your method, your narrating, the way you construct the field. Yeah, thank you, that would be great. Yeah, this is a great question. So I wanna clarify that people do live on the South Baltimore Peninsula today. And um, I only mentioned this very briefly at the beginning, but I came to this place not as an anthropologist, I came to this place as a first grade teacher. And so my first sort of like exposure to the environment here was through the eyes and bodies of very small people, six and seven year olds right, who, who had to take breaks during recess because it was uncomfortable for them to run around because the air is thick and many suffer from asthma. So there are people here today, not in Fairfield and Wagner's Point, two, two tiny uh, parts of this larger peninsula, but, but many, many people do live on the South Baltimore Peninsula today. Um, so I just wanted to sort of clarify that at the outset. Um, and you're, so you're asking me to talk about how I compose a field uh, across time. This is such a great question. You know, I, I often talk about my work as incredibly bounded in some ways and incredibly diffuse in others. So it is bounded to a six square mile site, right? This peninsula in South Baltimore City where I've been thinking with people for a long time now, it's very dis dis dispersed over time. So the, the book uh, that's coming out next year, it begins with the founding of Baltimore City and traces the story of these two places from that moment. One could begin the story earlier and I hope that someone will write that book, but you know, you can only do so many pages with today's presses. Um, so focusing on a six square mile space allows me to move through time with quite a bit of depth. Um, and then I, I kind of want to bite my own response just then because uh, I think another essential part of the method here is that the six square mile space is not actually just an isolated peninsula, but it collects the material detritus of a range of world making projects, right? From public health regimes to, uh, to uh, the American military, to the multinational corporation. So actually studying the air in the six square mile space is to study governance at a range of different scales as they're impacting people's lives. So we have uh, spatial scales and temporal scales and what allows me to follow them is, is staying here. Um, and and to, to give you like a really um, concrete illustration of this. So a lot of the, the book and a lot of my research <clears throat> is actually based in, in the like 2015, 2016, um, when I did my longest period of field work uh, on youth activists work to fight the construction of that climate solution, that incinerator. Uh, and it would have been built on a site that was previously a chemical plant, that before that was a space for shipbuilding for the Second World War, which before that was a quarantine zone. So it's a 90 acre plot of land with that same, like that same sedimentary uh, history. So, so 
I hope that answers your question, Felix, about like how right, staying in a small place that is actually a, that actually contains material traces of many other places and projects. Um, it doesn't answer the question about the narration. Uh, so I'll just briefly say that uh, when I wrote this piece um, a long time ago, it's the first chapter I wrote for my dissertation, and it's been re rewritten many times since then. Um, but it was important to me to make sure that the story was interrupted over and over and over by explosions, right? So the, the sort of interruption of narrative coherence and the coherence of a life that people that people experience is the way that the narrative proceeds as well. So thanks. So a few questions in the room. Um, start here and we've got two on the center. Not so much a question as much as a comment. I found that comparison to the both of us actually really interesting. Because with the book of the lesson, there was the discourse of threat beforehand. There was one journalist working in Bob Hall who was writing on like this is a disaster going to happen. He was writing right up until the week before the gas cloud went down into the went down into the neighborhood. But there was no with the book of the disaster, there was nothing beforehand like the workplace where there were these industrial explosions that made it very visible that something was about to happen. I think almost to use your metaphor that you use, those small industrial explosions were the ticks in the time bomb that made it visible. They made it ready for made it so people could see it, whereas Bhopal wasn't as visible. I mean, I think in many ways you're right, and residents certainly narrate their like coming to um they're coming to a threshold of political action in that way. But I also want to add here, and I've been thinking about this a lot, um, like another, another factor here is whose lives, whose potential deaths res, rise, rise to the level of political crisis, right? It's a question that answers itself, if you think about the difference here. And I'll say like the, the I only shared a, a few of the sort of like um, PSAs and films and advertisements that were circulating here. The chapter actually talks a lot about 80s disaster films, which are a big part of this story and part of the political field, but white protagonists, every one of them, whose premature deaths become a political problem. So that too. Melissa and Patrick. Um, Again, the things that <laughs> yeah. Um, but that's you know, you know, there. So I'm going to try to uh, I'm going to do that again. Mm -hmm. uh, ask uh, a technical question to be a bit of you know. Okay. The technical question is where did they go mm -hmm. <laughs> after the bio? Um, I uh, most of my research is in the Pacific. And the idea of evacuating people prior to everything being destroyed in the common area, between, for example, the mm -hmm. um, where there are incredibly, incredible footage of memes <laughs> and bubbles of everyone's perfectly good to be loaded onto um, US aircraft carriers to be removed from the landers from, from things that would be destroyed. Okay. And that gets me to my theoretical question. The removal of um, people from the Marshall Islands prior to US nuclear testing was a way to, uh, what, what, what were the words of your, your city authorities? You know, now that the, we're happy the area is clear. Yeah, we no longer have clear. to be concerned. Yes, so now that they were concerned, the area is clear. Mm -hmm. The people are out of the picture. So I'd like to know where the people went. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and the people being out of the picture then releases them, I guess, in their own view, from liability. Then the state? This is the state. Liability <laughs> is a really interesting way to think about time. Yes. <laughs> because it's a way to think about time in terms of your own anticipated future guilt or responsibility for something going terribly wrong. We do this every time we make our students and ourselves do our ethics for mm -hmm. 
which of course that's nothing to do with that. We know this, right? That's nothing to do with ethics, it's everything to do with liability. That's not how the whole system about ethics. But it is about how institutions think about liability, whether it's a university or whether it's a, a city or, or a state government. So I'd love to know, okay, one, where do we go? Two, yeah. two how does liability help us think about your work in terms of the, 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 the city of Baltimore, the state of Maryland, um, try to remove its relationship with the people it has taken out of, um, of, of this area? I have so much to say, and I hope, I hope my partner's watching because he's a lawyer, and like we can make, I like make sure I'm understanding these terms as I go. Where did the people go? Different people in different places. So residents of all Black Fairfield tended to met more or less leave Baltimore, uh, and this actually ends up being really consequential for a few reasons. Like one, um, it makes it very hard for an ethnographer in the present to to think in a a, a meaningful way about um, the Black working class which was fractured by this displacement. And so there are consequential gaps in the ethnographic archive that one has to name and contend with. Uh, white residents move very close, right? So I don't have the map pulled up. And again, I don't want to mess up the, the Zoom thing, but uh, the South Baltimore Peninsula is composed of a few past and present neighborhoods, Fairfield and Wagner's Point, Hawkins Point, also displaced in the 80s to build a major landfill. Uh, Curtis Bay and Brooklyn, existing communities and Masonville bought out in the 50s for the B&O Railroad to expand. So Curtis Bay and Brooklyn still inhabited. They're, they're like, you can walk. You can walk from one from this place to that place. And many white residents of Wagner's Point moved there for a few reasons, but one reason is that uh, Baltimore City, especially as we get into the 80s and 90s, is a very diverse place. And for white, formerly white ethnic residents who attained a sort of unmarked whiteness relatively recently in their history, so we're talking about like the, the World War II moment, these are people who guard that whiteness very jealously. They want to move to parts of Baltimore that are white. And, and at the time, this has changed, but like at the time, like Curtis Bay, uh, is a very white neighborhood for a majority black city. And so racism is part of the story there. Another part of the story is a network of meaningful connections. Again, so like white children from Wangers Point rode buses past Fairfield to go to school with children from Curtis Bay. So we have friendships and we have familial networks, but the, the, uh, the racialized dynamics here are really complicated. Uh, and, and, you know, like people narrate this, um, if through crime instead of race, right? It becomes a code for this, but like, uh, I'd rather move, I'd rather, I'd rather take my chance with the air than move to the projects uh, and risk, you know, like being shot, which some describe as like, uh, uh, gunfire is like high velocity lead poison. This is a phrase that I've heard before from residents and industry, amazing. So, so many people stayed very close. On the question of liability and time, if I can get there. Um, this is such a great question. No one's ever asked me this question. So liability in temporal terms, well, maybe a, when, when residents signed away liability, you know, like on the dotted line to get their meager buyout packages, what they do is they signed away past harm and future impact, right? So they can't hold a, hold a corporation responsible for decades of exposure or previous explosions or for the, you know, like cancer that will develop 20 years later, right? It's a dissociation, a cutting of relations. And this is actually, a, I, I, uh, Daniel knows this because I wrote a piece for his collection, but I think a lot about dissociation as a method of governance in this place. It has many layers and it's also a lived mode of coping with this mode of governance. So people dissociating by shutting their doors, making sure their living room is, is immaculate, but their porch is a mess, or uh, wrapping their food in cellophane to keep away the dust. I mean, those are quiet dissociative habits. So liability is a it, uh, liability is what you don't have when you sign away past harm and future impact. It's a really, really great question. I hope that's responsive. Yeah, thank you. 
a piece on dissociation is a good sort of short introduction to your work as well, I think, that's in anthropological theory commons, so it's all open access online. Um, so we've got Patrick in the room, and then if anybody else uh, online as well, I'm happy to come back to the Zoom, just make a, a note in the messages there and we'll come to you uh, on Zoom. But um, Patrick. Um, thank you for that was a beautifully presentation. Um, and finally, one of the questions you kind of answered just now already, which was about this, we spoke about uh, personal and corporate lives, and maybe the prosperity of being tethered and sort of untethered. So I was going to ask more about that, but this sort of seems uh, to really cool and sign the way um, uh, uh, this, the idea of this association seems to be a lot more of uh, an untethering of, uh, of, of futures and, and accustomed relations, as you say. The other, the other question was about the role of nuclear uh, and nuclear disasters play in your presentation and then in this claim as well. So, Graphically, you, you detect um, some scenes of apocalyptic scenes of, of uh, nuclear explosions. And I suppose I'm thinking about your work in relation to the last one's work as well, and ideas of fallout and existential uh, lags and, and lapse. Um, because so I, I just wanted to know what that look at the, the, the possibility of existential disaster was in creating. Uh, these uh, uh, residents uh, claims and ways of thinking about disaster because the kind of disaster that you, you speak about are almost seem quite different from that and that they uh, they seem to appear almost regular intervals um, and we say and then in the 90s and then in the 1980s and then you know the, these ones which are not clearly not I mean they may well be existential for the people but yeah. for the people who are involved but not at the scale of a nuclear disaster um, and clearly life to some extent goes on after them as well. So it's just that relationship to these maybe slightly smaller industrial disasters uh, that are to some extent sort of predictable and, and you know people are planning for and the, the nuclear apocalypse which for which obviously the planet not goes on yeah. um, but which would maybe have more devastating existential consequences at scale. Great questions. I, I, you asked two, I'm gonna answer three though, because I feel like there's an opportunity to, to address the images as well, maybe here. So first on, on the tetheredness, I think one thing I wanna add that I haven't said, you know, is like the, the cruel irony of this late industrial moment is that residents became more tethered to this place at precisely the time it became more dangerous. So job loss, poor <clears throat> people from, their, from the plants, but bound them to the land because their homes are all that they have left after they lose their jobs. And what determines the value of a home? Location. And so there become certain things you cannot say about your home and the place that you live if you wanna sustain life, right? Also like mortgage debt is a really interesting relationship with time. It's an investment in a future, in a place, an emplaced, uh, an in-place future. So anyways, it's, I wanted to just add that about the tethering. So it's one of the reasons that this is such a sticky wicket. <laughs> um, nuclear disaster. Um, Joe Mosca uh, was uh, such a great person to think with after I left my undergrad or my undergrad. Um, my my graduate program and started, I did a couple years as a postdoc at Chicago. And so he read some chapters and like just a really generous interlocutor. Um, his work has been really formative for me it being able to articulate why explosion becomes the mode of harm with political salience in this place. And one of the, I think, central insights of Joe Mosco's work is that the mushroom cloud becomes the idiom for thinking about endings and violence, um, both uh, on the level of the state, but also sort of like at, a, at multiple scales. Um, and so um, nuclear, nuclear imagery, uh, nuclear preparedness, right? Like these sort of like shelter in place PSAs are tied to the civil defense project. Um, so it's everywhere. Uh, and I think on an experiential level, you know, like when you, it, the, mush, uh, the mushroom cloud is how people describe the chemical, uh, the chemical clouds, right? So it, it literally is an idiom for thinking about what is happening here. And if you think about like lived experience, like you hear a boom and you're in a sort of media world and a political moment where, where the mushroom cloud is everywhere, you probably experience it precisely that way. So the, like, I'm not sure I'm prepared to make a meaningful distinction here, 
And the other thing I want to say is like, this was a place that was used during the Cold War to house strategic and critical materials, including chemicals. So thinking about even the nuclear regime as a mushroom cloud is false, right? The nuclear regime is also the quiet warehouse, right? Um, and so what I really appreciate about Joe's work is he gives us language for, for retraining our, our, our eyes, right? Not on the mushroom cloud as the nuclear state, but on all of this as the nuclear state too. And then the question you didn't ask that I want to answer um, is on the images that I, that I use because um, uh, sometimes people are curious why I choose comic books. Uh, to mark the explosions. And I feel like a, a big part of the answer is that I, I want to avoid reproducing the spectacle of violence in my own work. So that feels very important to me. But it feels also important to mark the spectacle as it is lived. Um, and one of the reasons that I choose comic books uh, as advice of a friend is because they also capture the, the cultural production, right? The way that disaster has a sort of like ambient salience in art and media. Um, and again, I mentioned in response to another question, like 1980s and 90s, this is when disaster and apocalypse films are coming out like all the time. Um, and so uh, that too. Yeah, thank you. Okay, we've got uh, one online and we'll come to Cecilia and Christina uh, then. So uh, do our sheets ask, great talk, thank you. I have a question about framing. When and how did temporality come into your work as a theoretical framework that best captures industrial toxic toxicity in Baltimore? Was it while in the field of your interlocutors or later in the writing process or some other moment? It was in the field. Um, people talk about time all the time in, in, in this place. Um, my dissertation research, I mean, again, like it was a very historically informed project, but the sort of day-to-day -day ethnographic work was among youth activists who were organizing to fight the construction of this incinerator, which was a climate solution. Um, and it was very, one thing that was very important to their campaign um, was studying local history. And so I was very curious about how it was that local youth were, were learning and mobilizing this long, long history to make claims about, uh, about risk. Risk is another sort of future-oriented way of thinking about harm. Um, and, and so they were fighting this plant that had, just didn't exist yet, um, this, this future possible incursion. Um, and they were refusing the sort of um, temporalization of risk that comes from industry and the state, which is, which is all speculative. But uh, what was so interesting to me and so important for their work is that they were mobilizing a long history of cumulative impacts to make claims about why this plant was so harmful. And so um, time was always central. Um, I think one of the things that became clear to me during field work and in the writing since is that like I... I conceive the project as like being about two competing temporalities, right? There was like the, the temporality of risk coming from the state and industry, and there was the temporality of cumulative impacts, which was a way of narrating both how toxic exposure is embodied and how history works for people, history and memory. Um, but it's actually not that simple, right? There are not just two competing temporalities, one that's expert and one that's lay. Uh, the form of the book itself is about uh, like every chapter is around a different relationship with the future that's ambient in this place um, after Fortis, Fortis relationships with the future fall apart. And so there are actually many. Um, and so time has always been central, but it's gotten messier as the project pr has proceeded. Yeah. Great. And Cecilia and uh, Christina. Okay, so um, my question is probably yeah, following on from that comment. Um, but I just want to preface it with saying that I love disaster movies. Um, Me too. <laughs> I think I saw a disaster movie called Physical Apocalypse, which was filmed there. It must have been filmed there. Or somewhere I feel like I would know if it was filmed there. <laughs> <laughs> but it looked very likely, like, you know, how it was in five houses and then it kind of falls or in that field down mm -hmm. right next door. Um, that guy who was in the closet. Anyway, 
but um, yeah. So uh, it's, a, it's a bit a bit when you were talking, I, uh, that kind of came to mind, and it was a bit this dislocation of responsibility, mm -hmm. liability. So in that film, it sort of shifted to the aliens who come, you know, from yeah. The aliens so come convenient, and right? the ground and suddenly they erupt or hell breaks in them, literally. But um, uh, my question was uh, pro um, probably too broad, but you know, I was wondering how the different forms of local and corporate governance or local on the municipal scale, but also you know, these, these small communities. Um, how this relates to the temple, the temple project, um, which informs nation building in the States. So I was kind of wondering, like, so how does making America great again? Mm -hmm. kind of, you know, why why do they vote for it? You know, those kinds of politicians who seem to be completely complicit. In creating this situation and this disaster and con constant crisis and everything that came. I don't know. So it seems to me that, that there, there is this other large temporal frame of, of modernity, mm -hmm. which you know we could think of as a crisis in modernity, but um, is actually a national project in the world great success, I suppose, in the States. And, and it's probably a very ignorant question. No, it's the question, right? Um, it's a really important question. I wanna, uh, well, maybe I'll talk with you after about disaster movies because I like don't know if I could stop myself, but there's an amazing one that I write about in, I'll just briefly say in the chapter from which this talk is, comes called Acceptable Risk. And the reason I write about it is the mayor at the time, Mayor Schaefer at the time of all this, these shenanigans, he received like a, a letter from one of his aides that it was going to be on TV. This is made for a, a TV movie. Um, and it was almost identical to the situation here. And he was livid. He was like, what can we do to get into like respond to this film? You know, um, and, and the city ends up mobilizing to put PSAs on after the film on TV to say like, look how responsible we are. We've got the situation under control. Here's how we're prepared for disaster. So disaster films have like a real, like, the mayor is watching them and like thinking about his responsibility to this place in relation to those films. So uh, anyways, why do why do people vote for Trump in, in the context of this history is how I'm gonna interpret that question. Um, it's complicated. Uh, Christine Wally, uh, whose work is on post-industrial Chicago has made the very important point that not every, not like there's a, there's a narrative in the United States that like the white working class elected Trump. Um, and this is a partial truth um, because also the wealthy uh, elected Trump um, and, and the working class is a complicated thing. But I will say that many of my contemporary uh, white, white, more uh, elderly interlocutors did vote for Trump. Um, and not because he was even their first choice. I was there during the primary elections attending seniors clubs with elders playing bingo. They bring me the paper. They tell me to give it to my husband. You know, like um, we would talk about these things. Uh, and I thought the, the primary process was a process of, of seeing like candidate after candidate leave. And so Trump was the, like, it could have been worse is the language that people use to describe both Trump and actually uh, the incinerator that was being proposed for their neighborhood. I write about this uh, in an article that I'm happy to share. I think one really salient thing that Trump and like make America great again promise though is a renewal of a certain kind of prosperity. And despite this very real history and people's memories of it, there is still a meaningful attachment to the kinds of lives that were possible with industrial jobs. So people here live with all of the same risks, but none of the stability. And so the language of renewal is really meaningful for many people. The fact that materially Trump didn't, doesn't offer that is sort of irrelevant because no politician offers what they promise. But uh, there's there's great work by um, communication scholar, I think his name is like Chris McCarthy, to look it up. Uh, and I wanna make sure this doesn't come across like an apology for Trump, but he was the first person to address factory workers in so long. 
Um, and this meant people. And it's, it's sort of belatedly that uh, the center and the left are realizing that um, they need to address working class people in the United States. It's also important, and this was erased from both the political sort of sphere and the media attention around Trump, that the working class is not just white in the United States. Black working class people live in South Baltimore too, fewer after the buyout, but anyway, so those, those are some of my responses uh, to that question. And we'll see what happens next year. Yeah. Hi, You're okay. <laughs> um, so I'm just kind of curious about uh, the, the nature of the work of the state government. So that when um, um, my, my husband was called into the same kind of area he was delivered, when they, uh, the residents were brought up, okay, who finds them out? Mm -hmm. so, so it was actually not that he can't help, but not enough to stay. It was a historic buyout. It was actually the first buyout in the country. I'm going to tell you. <laughs> that gathered money from the city, state, and federal government, and private industry. That had never happened before. It was, it was every entity that was responsible for harm. That's got their liability signed away in that moment. Exactly. Yes. That's exactly what I was thinking. Because that agreement. That, that everybody well it's not like they gave them a lot of money let me just be clear like these residents were not walking away with like thick pockets no, but yeah No, people did. There was, I mean, like every every bit of this story that is already too long was fought tooth and nail. Um, the the process of negotiating the buyout took years. It took years. It almost never happened many many times over a variety of things. One of them actually was the valuation of homes. I was talking about location earlier. So originally they were like, okay, we're, well, these homes aren't worth that much because they're in like a heavy industrial zone. So, and they were like, no, that's not our fault. And so it took years for residents to get uh, these entities to agree to value the homes as if there were not industry there. So they could actually move and buy homes. So everything was contested. And this was, con and no, like this final deal was contested too. And residents were able to get some kind of buyout without signing liability waivers, but it was so small. A lot of the money hinged on signing on the dotted line. And, and it wasn't like, just like it wasn't like residents weren't aware of all the things that were lost in an argument about the politics of threat. It's not like they weren't aware of what they were signing away when they signed on that dotted line, but they're, they're being held hostage, right? Like, I thought yeah. that their sign. But it's more than just alluding to the local government mm -hmm. and all of those people there's, who were there saying, hey, there's this amazing quote, and it would take me a while to dig for it from, so Mayor Schaefer, I was talking about earlier, he was like, oh my God, this this disaster film, like, it makes us look really bad, because uh, it's literally about the city agrees to uh, an, a zoning exemption that would allow uh, homes to be built next to a chemical plant. And and of course it goes horribly wrong. And then like Cecily Tyson is the female lead. I don't know if you're familiar with her, amazing uh, late actress. And the like the searing line at the end is we killed all the people with the zoning law. So it's just so close. Anyway, so Mayor Schaefer, uh, by the time the bat actually happens, he's become governor. And Mayor Schmoke is the mayor, and he has this amazing line about like how they didn't the buyout. <laughs> The buyout actually wasn't explicitly linked to this stuff in the end. It was linked to the city's need for land. So they're going to buy out these homes because they want to expand the wastewater treatment plant. That's like the narrative. And Mayor Schmoke says in an interview with Brenda, one of the lawyers, um, 
it was so important for the buyout to be linked to the city's need for land because they didn't want to have to talk about the incinerator, the medical waste incinerator here too, and its impact on kids. Like even in the moment of paying for all the reasons that we've talked about, the city could not, it did not want to establish precedent, another legal, yeah, right? Like that, that it should be responsive to environmental problems in this place because people wow. stayed in the place. It is so stunning. Yes. Yes, it is. Okay, we're coming towards the end of the allotted time. Um, I think it's probably a good place to, to wrap up. I just wanted to say thank you to Simone and the ASA who co-sponsored this. Um, we didn't mention that at the beginning, that the ASA and our department here in St. Andrews have sponsored this talk. To Gabriella for the work with the ASA's Anthropology of Time Network and for the introduction. And of course, to Chloe for a wonderful talk. And thank you so much for coming all this way to give it to us. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you.